On November 8, 2002, police received a call from a concerned woman reporting that her neighbor had been assaulted by an unknown male. Officers immediately went to the scene. There they discovered the lifeless body of Annalisa Raimundo, but the strange thing was that the entire house had been thoroughly cleaned. During the investigation, the officers were able to uncover details of a very strange and horrifying love triangle that led to this tragedy. Sheila Devalu was born on May 11, 1969 in Iran and was the daughter of a couple whose names remain unknown. The only thing that has come to light is that they both worked in the medical and healthcare fields. In the late 70 seconds, Sheila and her family emigrated to New York, USA, fleeing riots and bloodshed. There, after studying at a state university, Sheila earned a degree in biochemistry. At the same time, she married Farid Mousevi. However, during her graduate studies, she crossed paths with another New York colleague, Paul Christos. From that point on, a secret affair began between them, which Farid found out about a few months later and asked Sheila for a divorce. With a free path to be together, Paul and Sheila tied themselves in marriage in 2000. Around this time, Sheila received her graduate degree and was hired for a lucrative position in medical research at Padu Pharma, located in Stanford, Connecticut. Paul was working at the local campus of Cornell University at the time. Things seemed to be going well professionally, but the flames of passion were almost extinguished. They weren't a conflicted couple, but it became apparent that their relationship had stagnated into a domestic routine. Sheila felt that her personal life had become ordinary and boring, and soon found a man who could break the monotony. In the summer of 2001, during a meeting after work, Sheila met Nelson Sessler, who was not only handsome, but also successful and extremely charming. Nelson was not indifferent and did not try to quiet her obvious attraction. They immediately began dating. However, Sheila would not admit to him that she was a married woman. As the office romance took hold, she came up with a cunning plan to deceive her lover and her husband. She didn't want to choose one of them and she didn't want to be blatant by letting them decide whether to join the love triangle she had created. The truth was that Sheila had become obsessed with Nelson. So she made up a supposedly mentally deranged brother and told Paul that he would visit her from time to time. In addition, this brother might have been upset to learn that she was now married. Therefore, on such occasions, Paul had to disappear from the house. The man believed Sheila and indeed every time it was his turn to leave home, he would help her pack up her belongings including clothes, toiletries and family photos and then leave to spend the night at his parents' or friend's house. In turn, each time Nelson visited, Sheila would make up other stories to keep her marriage a secret from him. This woman was truly obsessed with Nelson, but to her dismay, she was not his only love interest. On the contrary, he had his eye on another co-worker who worked alongside Sheila. Annalisa Raymond was born in September 1970 in Brooklyn and was the eldest daughter of Renette and Susan Raymond, a Filipino-American physician couple. She had a sister, Bernadette, and an unidentified brother. Anna always showed the precociousness of success. She was beautiful, energetic, intelligent, and strong. Another of her many qualities was her unconditional love for her family, and especially her sister. After graduating from Harvard University in Massachusetts, she earned a master's degree from Columbia University in New York. Anna then took a job at Purdue Pharma, where she won the admiration of her co-workers from the very beginning. At that time, the girl's life represented everything she dreamed of and even more. And so in the midst of these idyllic everyday life between the perfect job and self-realization, Anna fell in love with the seductive Nelson, who could charm a stone. And this romance couldn't help but strike her as striking, for when she met him, she realized how different they were from each other. She had taken the matter rather lightly, wanting to take the time to get to know and like each other. Perhaps for that reason, they didn't put much eyeballs on their relationship. But closer to the winter of 2001, Nelson decided to break up with Sheila and cited his intention to create something lasting with Anna as an excuse. Sheila reacted indifferently, considering their relationship just a summer fling. Meanwhile, Anna received a very lucrative job offer, quit her job and moved to another company in New Jersey. The affair was going well, and she felt she was ready to commit to Nelson. Gradually, he became a part of her life, and by the second half of 2002, Anna and Nelson moved in together and became more open about their relationship. This caused Sheila indescribable anguish, and she tried with all her might to rekindle the love that had now become utterly impossible. In the midst of this inner storm, she did impossible things, such as pretending to seek her husband's good advice on a matter of concern to her. Sheila began telling Paul about the alleged love triangle in the office, asking for advice for an imaginary friend she nicknamed Melissa, who was none other than herself. 
She even borrowed her husband's night vision goggles and a listening device to help Melissa watch Nelson. Then the girl took a riskier step. She bought a lock-picking kit and spent time learning how to use it. It was about that time that Sheila learned that Nelson was going to Las Vegas and alone. She had no better idea than to follow him to his destination and make him believe that their meeting at the same place was a mere coincidence. As Nelson flew back, he was surprised to find that Sheila turned out to be his seatmate. Although the case did not proceed, Sheila already had a plan that would change everyone's life. On Friday, November 8, 2002, Nelson left for work early in the morning, and Anna planned to meet with colleagues at day to get some rest. Between 10.30 a.m. and 12 p.m., Sheila managed to get into the house, and there, using a knife, she took Anna's life. She then washed her hands in the bathtub and fled the scene. Shortly after noon, Sheila went into a nearby restaurant and, using a payphone, called emergency services. She did not identify herself or the victim, but said her neighbor had been attacked by an unknown male. After calling 911, detectives Tom Jint and Greg Hold arrived at Anna's apartment and found her lying on the floor. There were no signs of forced entry or forced entry into the apartment, so they assumed she had opened the door herself to her attacker. However, there were signs of a violent struggle, a small bloodstain and scattered objects, including plants that were dear to Anna. In the meantime, it was time for an informal meeting with colleagues, which Anna did not attend. They didn't pay much attention to it, as Anna was rather unpunctual. But after a while they made more than 20 calls, which she did not answer. In the meantime, the investigation was progressing, and as usually happens in such cases, the agents focused on her immediate surroundings, starting with her boyfriend. But they didn't have to look for him, because Nelson drove up to the house himself. Tom and Greg broke the news to him and then asked him to wait outside. Unlike Anna's family, who were stunned by the news, Nelson took it calmly and didn't even ask for details, which came as a surprise to the officers and compounded the situation by the fact that the man went to bed without further ado. Based on this combination of factors, he became the prime suspect. During their interview with the man, officers questioned him about past affairs in an attempt to find clues. And while Nelson mentioned his two ex-girlfriends, both of whom had mental health issues, he said nothing about Sheila, mostly because he thought she was a mentally stable woman. Subsequent examination of his workplace footage confirmed his alibi. It also revealed that Nelson left and returned home wearing the same clothes and there were no bloodstains on them. Based on what was described in the anonymous call, police focused their search on the other suspect. The difficulty, however, was the complete lack of leads, and it was not possible to identify the caller either. According to the owner of the restaurant with the payphone, he did not remember who used the machine. Investigators also combed the neighborhood and found no one whose voice matched that of the mystery woman. On this seemingly dead-end path, the only important piece of evidence was a trace of blood on Anna's bathroom sink, but this made it impossible to link it to any particular person. As for the autopsy, it showed that Anna had suffered a stab wound that punctured her lung, as well as several blows to the head. The police began to speculate that the caller might have been involved in the murder, but weeks passed and the trail was lost. Meanwhile, Sheila took the opportunity to comfort the grief-stricken Nelson, and the affair soon resumed. She was thrilled with the reconciliation and arranged romantic dates, including trips to a ski resort. However, Nelson showed her by his behavior that the relationship was nothing more than a fleeting casual fling. Around the same time, Sheila was disappointed that she could not get the same feelings from the man she was obsessed with and fell into a kind of depression. She slept more than usual and found it difficult to do simple tasks, such as paying bills. Paul, through no fault of his own, didn't notice these signs. Suddenly, the woman stopped being sad. On the morning of March 23, 2003, Sheila woke up with renewed energy. She got her nails done, chatted on the phone with a few friends, and arranged for her and Nelson to meet at home for dinner that evening. After dinner, she suggested Paul spice up their relationship by blindfolding him and handcuffing him to a chair. The idea was to touch him with unknown objects and make him guess them, but this was no game. Her scheme was monstrous. Sheila took advantage of his vulnerability and stabbed him twice in the chest with a kitchen knife and then tried to convince him that it was an accident. Although Paul wasn't sure exactly what had happened, he knew he needed urgent medical attention and asked her to call emergency services. Sheila pretended to do so, but she actually called Nelson's number to rule him out that she needed to cancel the appointment. Afterward, she told Paul that the line was busy. Eventually, he managed to convince her to take him to the nearest hospital. 
However, instead of taking him to the emergency room, Sheila stopped the car in a secluded corner of the parking lot and further stabbed him in the chest with a sharp kitchen knife she had taken from home. The passerby witnessed the attack, and Paul was hospitalized at a medical center. As for Sheila, she was apprehended by police while attempting to flee the scene and was soon questioned by a detective. Sheila initially denied all charges, saying, he came in and said the injured man was lying on the floor, and he said, can you see if I'm bleeding? I threw up when I saw the blood. I can't see it. Officers checked her cell phone record to confirm her version of events and quickly verified that she had never called the emergency number and also determined who she had actually called. Nelson was summoned by authorities and was shocked to learn that Sheila was married and had brutally attacked her husband Paul. By all accounts, the woman did not expect her husband to survive, but a miracle happened when he regained consciousness. His account contradicted her own. This prompted a series of further questions. I can't believe Paul told you that. Tell me about the game, because now we know about it. We were just playing. It got out of control. It didn't get out of control. Then Nelson had a hunch, maybe Sheila wasn't who he thought she was. She had proven herself capable of anything. Then Anna's death came to mind, and suddenly he felt everything fall into place. Nelson called investigators, asked them to check her out as a suspect in his fiancé's murder, and promised to help with the case. Sheila, meanwhile, was arrested and charged with the attempted murder of her husband Paul. While behind bars, she sent four letters to Nelson. In one of them, she wrote that if she had known that she and Anna were living together, she would have behaved differently. The letters generally ended in somewhat incoherent poems, and several times Sheila wrote that she loved him and always would. Only then did Nelson realize the depth of her feelings for him, the intensity of which clearly bordered on obsession. After a while, Sheila was released on bail, and Nelson stayed around as he needed to get her to talk. In the spring of 2003, he began recording all conversations with Sheila for the Stanford Police Department. One such conversation took place in September 2003 at a fast food restaurant. Nelson was wearing a microphone and was instructed to maintain a conversation with Sheila and schedule a follow-up appointment. During the conversation, Sheila expressed her bewilderment at the police's inability to solve the mystery of his fiancé's death. In response, Nelson asked her a direct question about Anna and when she had last seen her. Sheila replied that they had met in a pharmaceutical company elevator and never saw each other again. Meanwhile, it was time for Paul's trial, and as you might expect, Sheila went to all sorts of lengths to absolve herself of guilt. She claimed that she had been the victim of a bizarre set of circumstances that had led to the attack. According to her, she felt intense pain and tension, grabbed the knife and began to act in a way that was completely foreign to her up to that point, as she had never been violent on other occasions. Sheila claimed she didn't even remember doing it. In short, she based her strategy on the argument that she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, a theory later supported by her attorneys, who argued that the attack on her husband was an accident caused by emotional imbalance. Prosecutors, on the other hand, were convinced that Sheila deliberately delayed seeking help for Paul in the hope that the blood loss would be fatal because it would allow her to be close to Nelson. Catherine Ramsland, a professor of forensic psychology, said nothing in her behavior indicated that she was concerned about whether Paul would survive. Ultimately, Sheila was found guilty of attempting to kill Paul and sentenced to 25 years in prison before being transferred to a women's correctional center. As for Paul, he filed for divorce that same year. Since the only suspect in Anna's murder was behind bars, investigators had plenty of time to gather all the materials and bring the case to trial. Three years later, DNA from blood in the sink directly linked Sheila to Anna's case, allowing authorities to charge her with the murder of the girl she thought was her rival. The trial in that case took place in 2012. Sheila waived her right to counsel and chose to represent herself, although she was counseled throughout the trial by public defender Barry Butler. On February 10, 2012, Sheila was found guilty. This time she was sentenced to 50 years in prison, in addition to her previous sentence. After serving her first sentence, Sheila was to be transferred from New York City to correctional facilities in Connecticut. She will not be eligible for parole until 2079, when she turns 110 years old. In November 2017, Sheila broke her silence to the media and gave an interview to famous TV host Piers Morgan. At the time, she was incarcerated in New York City's Women's Correctional Center, which served as the inspiration for the prison in the Netflix series Orange as the season hit. She has stated that she is innocent of the two heinous acts attributed to her and that evidence is not synonymous with truth. 
She also acknowledged her role in Paul's case, but denied that her desire was to end his existence. Sheila also insisted that she was not near Anna's apartment at the time of her death, and argued that the traces of her DNA in Anna's bathroom were the result of cross-contamination of evidence by police officers. She also denied the prosecution's motive, arguing that she could have divorced her husband rather than going to such a drastic measure as a fatal attack. 